Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Math 221. So today we're going to cover section 10.1, graphs, definitions, and basic properties. So graphs are one of the more fun things in math. I think I really enjoyed studying them um, in graduate school and if you really like graphs after this lesson you can go to grad school for math and study graphs for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay so what is a graph? So I'm giving you my informal definition here first and then we'll look at the textbook author's uh, more formal version later. But basically a graph is just a set of vertices and a set of edges that connect some of the vertices. So the vertices are just some objects, they can really be anything, it's just a set. And then the edges are just pairs of vertices that are connected and usually they um, represent some kind of relationship. I'll show you some examples. Um, but we can use graphs to model lots and lots of different useful situations, particularly nowadays um, that a lot of the math and um, discrete math researches regarding computers, they are really, really uh, useful. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So in this graph, uh, the vertices are people. Uh, so we have these uh, nine people that are named for the letters of the alphabet. And edges connect people who have partnered on a project in the past. So here is our edges down here. Um, for example, we can see that Bev and Kai have worked together on a project in the past. Uh, we can see that also in the table here that Bev has worked with Kai and Kai has also worked with Bev. Um, and then for example, Dan and Ed have worked uh, on a project together in the past, which we can also see um, over here in their uh, listings. Okay, so that is this graph. And then a natural question you might want to know from a graph like this is whether there is a way to assign the people into groups of three so that everyone in each group has worked with at least one person in the group before. And uh, this would be the type of question people would like design an algorithm to try to answer. So I think there is a way to do it. And it's if we put these three people together, and then if we put um, these three people together, and then I shouldn't have used the same color as the graph, sorry. <laughs> but if we put these three people together, uh, then everyone in those groups will have worked with at least one person in the group before. Let's look at another example here. So the last example, um, was people who had worked together. And this example, the vertices are radio towers. And so towers that are close together have to broadcast on different frequencies so that they don't interfere with each other. Uh, towers that are close enough to interfere with each other in this graph are connected by edges. Uh, so this is the actual uh, Google map of the nearby radio stations to the university. So there's the, the SU uh, radio station is right here. And then there's some other ones uh, that are nearby and they're all close enough that they would interfere with each other. So all of them are connected on this graph. Um, so this is another type of thing that we model with graphs, um, some type of relationship or some type of interference. Um, and then a natural question here might be how many different frequencies are needed so that none of these towers interfere with each other. And on this one, I think it's uh, pretty clear since they're all connected to each other, you need five different frequencies. Uh, but if they weren't all connected, then uh, we would have a little more trouble to think about how many we need. Okay, let's look at a third example here. So graphs are really, really useful also for scheduling problems. So this graph's vertices are sections of classes, and this is actually the fall 2020, um, some of the 100 level math classes. So two sections are connected if their times conflict with each other. And then a natural question you might want to know about these classes is how many different classrooms do we need in order to schedule all these classes uh, without conflicts? And I think it's not too hard to see that you only need two different classrooms. So you can have all of these ones right here. You can put those in uh, room one. And then you can put all of these ones in a second room, room two. But obviously if your graph was more complicated than this, then it could actually be very difficult to figure that out. So there are lots of algorithms out there for figuring that out for you. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the difference between a graph and a graph diagram. We just looked at some graph diagrams, um, but a graph is not its diagram. A graph is just the set of vertices and the information about how they are connected and it is independent of how those vertices are arranged in space. So the vertices arranged on a plane is not the graph, that's just a diagram. And the diagram is not the graph, it's just a visual representation of some really abstract information. So in graph diagrams we usually draw the vertices as dots and then the edges as lines, but you do not have to do it that way. You could you know draw them with curves or uh, you could draw the dots with like words instead of uh, dots. Um, so you can do it in many different ways. And you can, even if you are doing it with dots and lines, there are lots of different ways to represent the same graph. So these three pictures here, this is all the same graph. It's just three different diagrams of the same graph. So you see in the second one here, we've sort of nudged uh, vertex four into the middle there. 
Uh, and then in the last one, we've uh, kind of swapped the positions of vertex three and vertex four, but we do still have the vertices all connected in the same way. So in all three pictures, one is connected to two, two is connected to three, three is connected to four, and four is connected to one. So they are the same graph. So you should imagine that vertices are kind of like thumbtacks and edges are kind of like rubber bands, and you can just rearrange the whole thing um, however you would like to. Of course, that makes it rather difficult to work with these sometimes from a mathematical perspective because they are so uh, rearrangeable. Okay, so let's look at an example from the homework problems where we are gonna try to show that these two graphs are actually the exact same graph by uh, labeling the one on the right according to the labels that are on the version on the left. So if I look at these two for a while and I think about the black dots as being thumbtacks and these uh, blue lines are rubber bands, I have to try to think how I'm going to rearrange it to look like the one on the right. And so there's a few things that are um, unique about this graph. Firstly, you have like, you have a, a, a like a loop of five edges right here. And um, then you also have a loop around the outside that is five edges like this, that's five. And then you have these little side wing panel things that are four edges, two, three, and four. And then another one with one, two, three, and four. So those are kind of the like defining characteristics of this graph. So I have to try to find um, where all that is on the one on the left. So let me show you. Um, I think that if I just take this vertex and move it down there, and then if I do, let's see, how will I do this? Um, I kind of see it in my mind, but it's a little hard to explain it. So I think if I move these ones up here and these ones up there, those are going to make my little wings. And um, so let me try relabeling it like according to that. So this is going to be V1 here, and this is going to be V4 here. So that's this one and this one. They're going to go up there. And uh, then V6 is going to be the one that comes all the way down here. Okay, and then that makes this V7 and V5. Um, and then these top two are going to be V2 and V3. Now to check that I've done this correctly, I need to make sure that the edges are all still connecting the right vertices. So um, E1, edge E1 should connect V1 and V2. So this is E1. And then E2 should connect V2 and V3. So this is E2. And then E3 should connect V3 and V4. So this is E3. And then let's see, E5 should connect V3 and V5. So this is E5. Okay, there's a lot of edges here. <laughs> E4 should connect V6 and V4. So this is E4. And then um, I still have a few more. So E6 should connect V5 and V6. So that's that. Um, E7 should connect V6 and V7. And then E8 should connect V1 and V6. So this is E8. And then uh, V2 and V7, let's see, where are they at? They should be connected by E9. And I think I got all of them, and I was able to see that all the vertices are still connected the way that they should be, by the right edges. Um, so indeed, these two uh, different diagrams represent the same graph. Okay, so here is your homework problem. Um, you might, I just had to do some dragging around of vertices in mine, but I think you actually might need to do like a flip in yours as well. Um, so go ahead and try this and check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so now that we've looked at some examples and we've uh, done a little bit of playing with graphs, let's look at the actual formal definitions uh, that we need for this section. So a graph G consists of two finite sets, a non-empty set V of G of vertices and a set E of G of edges, where each edge is associated with a set consisting of either one or two vertices called its endpoints. So the edges have two endpoints, or sometimes they just have one endpoint if it goes from a vertex back to itself. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. The correspondence from edges to endpoints is called the edge endpoint function. Um, so the edge endpoint function, it's just like a list that you make where you have the name of each edge and then the endpoints that it connects. We'll see examples of those two in a minute. An edge with just one endpoint is called a loop, and two or more distinct edges with the same set of endpoints are said to be parallel. Again, I'll show you examples in a second. An edge is said to connect its endpoints. Two vertices that are connected by an edge are called adjacent, and a vertex that is the endpoint of a loop is said to be adjacent to itself. 
An edge is said to be incident on each of its endpoints, and two edges incident on the same endpoint are called adjacent. A vertex on which no edges are incident is called isolated. Okay, so none of that probably made any sense, so let's go and look at some examples and it will make sense. Okay, so here's some examples of how to use this vocabulary. All right, so this is one graph over here on the right. It's got several different parts that are not connected, but I'm just thinking of it as one graph. So in this graph, uh, V6, which is here, is adjacent to V7 because they are connected by this edge right here, E6. So those two vertices are adjacent because they're connected. Uh, E6 is not adjacent to any other edges because there's no um, other edge that comes out of either V6 or V7. V5 is not adjacent to any other vertices, so that is an isolated vertex. You see the meaning of that word, it's like literally isolated from the others. Uh, you can't connect to any of the others. Uh, E2 and E3, which are right here, those are parallel edges because they connect the same pair of vertices. They're not parallel in the geometric sense, but we just use that same word anyway. Um, E1 is adjacent to E4. So E1 is here and E4 is here. So those are adjacent because they both connect to V4, which is right there. And then V4 is said to be adjacent to itself because it has a loop right here. That loop is E5 um, and it's called a loop for like literal reasons. It just loops right back um, to V4. Okay, so I hope those uh, vocabulary are making sense to you. There are actually tons, tons, tons more <laughs> vocabulary in the field of graph theory. Um, whenever people see some kind of new sort of structure, they give it its own little vocabulary word. Um, mathematicians, we love making up vocabulary. <laughs> if you go and study graph theory, you can make up your own vocabulary too. Okay, so let's look at an example here to practice with this vocabulary a little bit more. Um, there is actually a part seven and a part eight to this question, but um, we'll look at those later once we've defined um, another vocabulary word later on. Okay, so number one is uh, find all edges that are incident on V1. So the edges that are incident on V1 is the edges that are coming out of V1. So it's this one, E1, and then it's this one, E2. And then finally, this one right here, which is E7. Okay, part two, find all vertices that are adjacent to V3. So V3 is here. And then adjacent vertices just means um, vertices that are connected to V3 by an edge. So if we look up at this edge right here, we see V3 is adjacent to V2. And then also along this edge right here, V3 is adjacent to V1. Okay, part three, find all edges that are adjacent to E1. So E1 is right here. Oops, my pen's not working. This pen stops working surprisingly often. Um, okay, so E1 is right here and we want the edges that are adjacent to it. That means um, any edge that basically touches one of the endpoints of E1. So another edge that's touching it. So like E2 is adjacent to it. And then uh, this one right here, E7, would also be adjacent to it. And I think that's the only two. Okay, so then part four, find all loops. Oops, so V doesn't have a dot over it. Okay, so find all loops. Uh, so this is a loop right here, E3. It goes from the same, ed, uh, the, the same vertex back to that vertex. And then E1 as well is a, is a loop. Okay, find all parallel edges. So I only see two edges that connect the same two vertices. So that's E4 and um, E5 are parallel. And then part six, find all isolated vertices. So there is an isolated vertex right down here, which is V4. Okay. All right, so here's your homework problem. Go ahead and try this and check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's talk about edge endpoint functions, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. So sometimes edges are just represented by a list of size two subsets. Like you could just represent the edges in this graph by that list right there and not give them their own names. But sometimes they are given their own names. Um, so in this one on the left here, we do have each edge has its own little name right here. And uh, when you've given them your own names, then you need to keep track of what vertices they actually connect. Um, so the edge endpoint function is just this table over here that keeps track of the, the endpoints of each edge, okay? So like for example, E1 is right here and it connects V1 and V2. E2 is right here and it connects V2 and V3. So it's just uh, keeping track of what vertices the edges connect. 
Okay, so let's do an example here where we work with that definition. So in one and two, graphs are represented by drawings. Define each graph formally by specifying its vertex set, its edge set, and a table giving the edge endpoint function. Okay, so first of all, um, they didn't tell me what this graph is called, so I'm just gonna call this graph uh, G because I like to name things. I'm a mathematician, so I name things a lot. All right, so V of G then is going to be just the list of vertices in a set. So this will be V1, V2, V3, V4, and I think that's all of them. And then the edges, I'm just gonna list the names of the edges in a set. So this is gonna be E1, E2, E3, E4, and E5. Okay, and then for my um, edge uh, endpoint function, I'm gonna have edges, and then I'm gonna have um, endpoints. Okay, so I'm gonna have E1, E2, E3, E4, and E5. Okay, and then over here I'm just gonna list the endpoints of each edge. So this is E1 connects V1 and V2, E2 connects V2 and V3, E3 connects also V2 and V3, and then E4 connects V2 and uh, V4, and then um, E5 connects V4 and itself, so I'm just gonna list that once. You can put it in there twice if you want. It's a set, so it doesn't make a difference if you put it in there once or twice. Okay, so that is this graph. And then if I was gonna, for example, if I was gonna store this graph on a computer, I would just store this information that's over here and not this graph uh, diagram because the, the lists are easier to store than the diagram and anyone who has those lists can reconstruct the diagram. Okay, so here's your problem. Go ahead and uh, try doing the same thing for this one and then check your answers in the back of the book. All right, let's look at another example where I do this in the reverse order. So I have the list of vertices and edges and then I have the edge endpoint function and I'm gonna try to draw the graph. Okay, so I think sort of the best strategy for drawing these is just put them in a circle. Okay, so I'm just gonna put my vertices in a circle like this. Um, that'll give me the sort of best use of space without knowing anything more about the graph. Okay, so there are my vertices. Okay, now edge E1 connects V1, just V1, so that's a loop from V1 to itself, like that. E2 connects V2 and V3. Oh, I should have labeled that, sorry. E2 connects V2 and V3, so this will be E2. Okay, E3 connects V2 and V3 also, so that's a parallel edge, E3. Okay, and then E4 connects V1 and V5, so it's gonna be like this. And that's it. Okay, go ahead and try doing the same thing for this graph and check your answer in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's talk about directed graphs. So um, there are a lot of different features that you can slap onto the basic idea of a graph. Uh, directed graphs is just one of them, but there's all kinds of other things you can do, like there's graph coloring, there's graph weighting, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. So a directed graph, um, or a digraph for short, consists of two finite sets, a non-empty set V of G of vertices, and a set D of G of directed edges. So instead of regular edges, we have directed edges. And each directed edge is associated with an ordered pair of vertices called its endpoints. So we're not having sets for the edges, now we're having ordered pairs for the edges. And if edge E is associated with the pair VW of vertices, then E is said to be the directed edge from V to W. So basically in a directed graph, the only difference from a regular graph is that you have arrows instead of just lines. And the arrows have a particular direction and you have to keep track of which direction they go. So if we have the ordered pair VW, then we have an arrow going from V to W, like that. Okay, so these can be really useful in um, problems where you're trying to mo you're trying to model not just a relationship but like a relationship that has some kind of order to it. Um, like for example, if you're doing a scheduling problem, you might have some tasks that have to occur before other tasks, and then it would make sense to make a digraph like this to put the little arrows like to show that V has to happen before W, for example. So here's another example. Um, this one is kind of cool. It was in the book, so I just thought I'd uh, show you this. Some kinds of artificial intelligence actually use directed graphs to represent knowledge. So in this graph, um, 
it's a little bit more than just a directed graph, like it's a more specialized kind of graph than that, because you can see that the labels on many of the edges are actually identical to each other. So this is actually like a digraph that has um, a, like a function from the directed edges to some words. Um, but anyway, this is this is quite interesting. So we can see in this graph, for example, the Los Angeles Times is an instance of a big city daily, and a big city daily is a newspaper, and a newspaper is a periodical, and periodicals are made of paper. So this is the kind of information that you would want an artificial intelligence to know about in order to intelligently answer questions. So that's kind of cool. All right, now let's talk about another kind of graph. So a simple graph is just a regular graph, but it does not have any loops or parallel edges. And in a simple graph, an edge with endpoints V and W is just denoted with a regular set, not with an ordered pair, just a set. So for example, here, um, this graph right here, this is a simple graph. There's no loops, there's no parallel edges. This one is not simple because it has a loop and it also has a parallel edge. Okay, let's talk about um, another kind of graph. Like I said, there are tons of different kinds of graphs. There are so many, you guys, there are like literally hundreds. Um, so this is one of the most uh, basic kinds that probably everyone who studies graph theory should learn about, the complete graph. So let n be a positive integer. A complete graph on n vertices, denoted k sub n, is a simple graph with n vertices and exactly one edge connecting each pair of distinct vertices. So these kind of graphs pop up in uh, graph theory a lot. In fact, we already saw um, in the example with the radio towers, that was actually a complete graph on five vertices. So it was like this one, although the way it was drawn, it was a little hard to see all of the edges. Uh, but so these are the first five complete graphs. You just draw um, n vertices and then you just connect them all. Okay, another type of basic um, graph is a complete bipartite graph. So let m and n be positive integers. A complete bipartite graph on m, m comma n vertices, denoted k m comma n in the subscript, is a simple graph with distinct vertices v1 through vm and w1 through wn that satisfies the following properties. For all i and k equal to 1 through m and all j and l equal to 1 through n, there is an edge from each vertex vi to wj. There's no edge from any vertex vi to any other vertex vk, and there is no edge from any vertex wj to wl. I think this definition is a little wordy. It's a lot um, simpler if you just look at the pictures here. So look at the pictures here. You have a group of v vertices, and you have a group of w vertices. None of the v's are connected, and none of the w's are connected, but all of the v's are connected to all of the w's. And the same deal down here, right? So none of the V's are connected, none of the W's are connected, but all the V's are connected to all of the W's. And then the little subscript here is just giving you the size of each set. So the size of the set on the left is the three, and then the size of the set on the left is, or on the right is the two. So um, probably there was a simpler way to write that definition. I don't know. Okay, so now let's talk about subgraphs. You're familiar with subsets, and in general in math, whenever you define any kind of object, there's also a sub object that you get by deleting some of the things from the original object. So if you take a graph G and you delete some vertices or some edges, you get a subgraph. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, so the formal definition here, we can define it like this as well. A graph H is said to be a subgraph of a graph G if and only if every vertex in H is also a vertex in G, every edge in H is also an edge in G, and every edge in H has the same endpoints as it has in G. So if you think about that for a while, um, I hope you can understand it is the same as this sort of less formal definition up here. If you take a graph G and delete some vertices or edges, you get a subgraph. So here's an example down here. Um, you can see that uh, graph A and graph B, those are both subgraphs of graph C. So we made A by just deleting this edge that was right there. And then we made B by deleting this other edge that was over here. So those are subgraphs. And then we could make lots of more subgraphs from this uh, graph C. Um, so for example, also um, just the graph of V2 and uh, V1, not even connected, that's also a subgraph. Um, you could also do, you know, you could just have like V1 connected by E3 to itself. That's another subgraph. Um, there's lots of different ones you could make actually. 
Might be an interesting counting problem to figure out how many different subgraphs there would be. Okay, so let's do a problem where we actually um, find all of the subgraphs of a graph. So I'm going to do part B. Um, I kind of don't want to do part C because there's, I happen to know there's actually 16 different uh, subgraphs of part C. So I'm just going to do part B for you. And then part A is your homework. So part B. Okay, so I'm going to draw each one in a little box so that you can tell them apart from each other. So the first subgraph is the entire graph. Okay, so that's one. And then another one would be if we delete the loop, that would be another one. Like that. And then another one would be if we delete the other edge but not the loop. So we'd have v0 down here and v1 up here and then the loop. Okay. And then another one would be um, if we delete both edges. So this will just be v0 and v1, like that, no edges. And then another one would be, let's see, what else could we do? We could just have v0 by itself. And then we could just have v1 by itself. Oops, I meant to put that on a different graph. <laughs> so we could just have v0 by itself. And then we could also just have v1 by itself. Okay, and then I think the last one um, that would be different is if we just have v1 by itself. And then the loop. Oh, and actually, you know, we could just have the empty graph. That's a thing. Okay, so I think that is all of them. Um, so with that, go ahead and pause the video and try part A, and then check your answer in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's talk about the concept of degree. This is something that's really important in graph theory. So let G be a graph and V a vertex of G. The degree of V, denoted deg of V, equals the number of edges that are incident on V with an edge that is a loop counted twice. So loops get counted twice. The total degree of G is the sum of the degrees of all the vertices of G. Okay, so look at this example down here, um, the little uh, circled vertex here. That vertex, <clears throat> if you zoom way, way in on it, and you sort of don't even notice that that loop is actually a loop, you can see that there's five little edges coming out of that vertex. That means its degree is five. So the loop is actually being counted twice because it connects to the vertex twice. So it's the number of edges or the number of connections to edges um, that each vertex has. And then for the, for example, this one down here would have degree one. Um, this would also be degree one and this would be degree one as well. So the total degree for this graph, we would just add those up. Uh, so we would get five plus one plus one plus one, which would be eight. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and do part seven and eight from number nine, which is the same graph that I used in an example earlier. So um, part seven, find the degree of V3. So degree of V3, all right, so let's look at V3. So V3 has two connections to edges, so that is gonna be two, okay? And then find the total degree of the graph. So I'm just gonna go through all five vertices and find their degree and just write that down. So this one has degree two, this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, that has degree six. This one has one, two, three, four, so degree four. This one has one, two, so two. And then this one has zero. So the total degree is going to be four plus six plus two plus two plus zero which is gonna be 14, okay? All right, so go ahead and try that on number eight, which is the graph you worked with earlier, and pause the video, try that, and check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's talk about the handshake theorem, which is actually um, a pretty interesting theorem. So if G is any graph, then the sum of the degrees of all the vertices of G equals twice the number of edges of G. Specifically, if the vertices of G are V1, V2 through Vn, where n is a non-negative integer, the total degree of G is, so you just add up the degrees of all the vertices, right? And then that is also going to be two times the number of edges of V, of G, sorry. So this is interesting and um, you might not expect this, but think about it really hard, what you were doing on the last slide when you were taking the total degree of the graph 
when you went around each vertex and you counted how many um, connections to edges it had, if you looked at it from the perspective of the edges instead of from the perspective of the vertices, you would notice that each edge was getting counted twice because each edge has two connections to a vertex, right? So that's why this actually makes sense. If you look at it from the perspective of the vertices, you're going around and counting all the connections to edges. And if you look at it from the perspective of the edges, each edge is having two connections counted um, per edge, right? So you should get twice the number of edges in G. Um, and notice that this also means that the total degree of a graph always has to be even. So there are some interesting things we can say because the total degree of a graph has to be even. And let's look at some problems where we use that fact. Okay, so I'm going to do 19 and 20 on this slide. So in each of 17 through 25, either draw a graph with the specified properties or explain why no such graph exists. Okay, so let's look at number 19. So in number 19, um, what I want you to notice is that the total degree there is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 4, which is 7. But no graph has an odd, degree, odd total degree. Just talked about that. So there is no graph like this that exists. You can try to draw one, but you won't be able to. Okay, so let's look at number 20 a graph with four vertices of degrees 1, 2, 3, and 4. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals uh, 10. So this should be possible. So let's try drawing one that is like that. So I'm going to need four vertices, so I'll just put them in a little uh, diamond pattern like this. Okay, and I want one of these to have degree 1. Um, so let's see, I'll just connect like that, and this can be the one that has degree 1. Okay, and then I want one of them to have degree 2, so maybe this one can be the one that has degree 2. So I'll connect that one over there like that. And then um, one of them needs to have degree 3, and then one needs to have degree 4. Hmm. So I can't connect anything else back to my degree 1 um, vertex, because that one is it would then have a greater degree. And the same for my degree 2 vertex. I can't connect anything else to those because um, they already have the degree they're supposed to have and I can't put anything more on them. So how's this last one going to have degree 3 and then degree 4? That's a little bit tricky. I think I'm going to need to do it like this with parallel edges like this. So that can have degree 3. And then to give my last one a degree 4, I'm going to need to make a loop like that. Okay, so now they all have the right degree. There might be another way to do this, I'm not really sure. Um, you could try it and see if there's another way. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and do number 17 and number 18 and check your answers in the back of the book. All right, so now let's look at a more kind of interesting type of problem. Um, so I'm gonna do 27B and 28. So let's look at part B here. In a group of four people, is it possible for each person to have exactly three friends? And why? Um, so in a group of four people, so let's try drawing a graph of four people and just see if we can connect them all to three other people. Um, so let's see, if I'm gonna have three, oops, I was gonna do this line next. So, okay, so now this person over here has um, three friends because they have degree three. And then let's see, if I connect this guy to these two, then they have, degree 3, and then if I do this as well, okay, then they all have degree 3. Um, so this is a yes. I've connected them all in these little lines here are representing uh, friendships. So yeah, they all have three friends, so that's possible. Now let's look at 28. In a group of 25 people, is it possible for each to shake hands with exactly three other people? Okay, so I don't want to try drawing um, the graph because it's going to need 25 uh, vertices, but I can already see this is not going to be possible. So if we tried um, making a graph with vertices um, being people and the edges being um, handshakes, then the total degree would be what? So we'd have each person connecting to three other people, 
right? So the total degree would be 25 times 3, which would be 75, but that's an odd number. So no graph has odd total degree. So the answer here is no. Okay, so go ahead and uh, pause the video and think about uh, number 27, part A, and check your answer in the back of the book. All right, that's it for today, guys. Uh, it's a pretty short lesson, um, so we'll resume studying some more about graph theory next time. See you later.